Hello, and welcome to another episode of Talking Tropes. I'm David. And I'm Hannah. And guys, we have quite an episode for you today. We are diving into the Friends and Fresh Prince of Bel Air uh, <laughs> specials, the reunion specials that aired on HBO Max recently. Um, yeah, I mean, these are by no means a new phenomenon. I mean, we've been having cast reunions since there were casts. Um, yeah. But I think that there is something a little bit new in that uh, there's never been anything like this on HBO Max before. And yeah. I don't think on HBO uh, about a property that they didn't themselves produce. Right. Um, but uh, there also hasn't really been many uh, reunion specials that have premiered on streaming sites uh, in, in general. Mm -hmm. And certainly not as a sort of selling point for a platform. Uh, so I think there's there's some interesting things going on here that are worth talking about, and and some sort of tropish things that may be sort of central to all reunion cast reunion specials. Um, yeah. But uh, I think one of the main things uh, that we want to sort of establish early on is, you know, that we're approaching these from a sort of critical distance. Uh, that maybe we're not as bought in as the intended audience for the specials. You know, uh, I didn't grow up with Friends or Fresh Prince being like the main shows I was watching. I have some nostalgia for Fresh Prince, but, you know, I'm, I'm approaching this as like, this is a promotional stunt. I, I, I guess I'm saying there's a lot of artifice in the presentation of these specials. What do you think, Anna? Yeah, there's definitely a lot um, that, you know, you sort of look at it and you're like, how much of this is real, you know, and how much right. of this, and it's, it's not only artificial, but it's like, it's very self-indulgent, you know, and I think that's true of, of any reunion um you know right i mean it kind of becomes sort of like you know a propaganda for the studios that produce these these shows uh mm -hmm. not just propaganda for the shows themselves because you're saying look what a great family environment that right. these people have come up in look at how well they get along with each other what you were seeing acting also was kind of real that mm -hmm. you you know you you took a peek behind the curtain and you didn't see a lifeless Chuck E. Cheese robot <laughs> you saw you know Ross and Rachel you know David Schwimmer and Jennifer right. Aniston they're the same they're really they're they really, really your friends they're and your they're, friends they're your friends and they were really crushing on each other and right. you know like Uncle Phil really was the like a dad to Will Smith and you right. know um like you know how much like we'll never know if that's true or not or if that's the narrative that they want us to buy you know it's it's reality tv but that right. that comes with the territory i think yeah um, i mean it, you it has to be read as industry discourse not just as meta discourse on the show itself so right. i think you know uh taking um John T. Caldwell's uh, approach to um, industry discourse and, you know, what their sort of disclosures are, that there's disclosure of certain secrets, but always as a way to sort of cover up or, you know, decorate the, uh, the disclosure in a form of like truthiness. So that you right. feel like, oh, okay, everything else must be true because they secretly revealed this thing that they weren't supposed to tell anybody. I mean, I think it's, I mean, this is just the vibe that I get from reunions in general. It's like, I was a theater kid growing up. Uh, and so were you, you were yes. in some plays. So like, you know, I get it. You work really hard on this thing and then it happens. And especially if that's your literal job for years and years and years, like, I get it. Like, yeah, these people are probably going to mean a lot to you. Um, but you know how everyone hates the theater kids, like, going to Denny's after, like, at the cast party after the show ends? You know, like, that's kind of the vibe of these things. <laughs> Where it's like, oh, we're best friends and like we had so much fun and here's all our inside jokes. But now it's not just 
annoying the other patrons of the restaurant it's annoying anyone who decides to watch it you know yeah what 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 were some moments um i guess we'll start with friends since that's the more recent and more sure. topical one uh <laughs> what, what were you know what were some of the moments that you felt were either annoying or successful or full of pathos or you know what 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 did they have for me i found the editing um of the friends special to be very strange where it sort of jumped between all these different segments like sometimes very randomly and would just like leave discussion topics entirely yeah, and just I like think, I think in some ways that, that almost speaks to to an authenticity to it um at, at least in those moments where you have a very jarring edit it means that they weren't able to sort of script a nice clean resolution to whatever point they were making yeah um, but but yeah uh what, what, what else um you know i would say like at least in the friends one james corden's <laughs> like presence at all and right. like the existence of a host who is so purposefully detached from the the friend's legacy that yeah. he's from another country he's a late night guy but he he's not the late night people who would have interviewed these people in the 90s he's right. too young and he's just there and he's i think he's operating on sort of like a lawyer logic where like you know you can't ask a question you don't already know the answer to right where he's sort of going in expecting certain, which is uh, of course how talk shows work as right. well, where the, you know, the press guy or the agent gives you some like, all right, you're going to ask him about uh, his recent trip to Maui with his wife. All right. And he's like, I hear you've uh, taken a trip to Maui. Like yeah, right. you heard from the press guy. <laughs> uh, so it like, it is like late night. In fact, yeah. it's like almost no different from, like the Colbert and, special where they brought it on the Daily Show people. And it's very awkward. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, they're just sitting here like, you know, like they clearly just want to be hanging out with each other. And they're like, okay, I guess we got to go perform for an audience and answer awkward questions. Woohoo! Like, you know, they, uh, like, it's just uncomfortable. Like, I felt bad for James Corden. Like, I, I don't think he's a particularly good interviewer to begin with. Um, but, like, this was just, like, a no-win sort of situation. And, and sort of along that lines, the cringiest moment of the Friends special for me personally is just the guest stars um, mm. and how they were both incorporated as, like, other cast members coming back or uh the fashion show that they did right and so you're talking just... about both the the guest stars from the original friends show yes. who came back to sort of you know be like hey surprise i'm here too it's a full cast reunion because now mr finkel is here or mr heckler sorry i, I forgot his name as well um or you know the the gellers are here and right you know like i guess that can be exciting but i think it's interesting that they they portray the friends actors as part of the audience in those moments yeah you can't tell them because they're the audience surrogates experiencing the shock and surprise at seeing them yeah and yet it's like once they experience that like there's no chance that someone's going to be like who invited this fucking guy all right <laughs> they're all going to oh we love you come here oh we love you we love you nikki or uh, we whatever love you. the hell your name is <laughs> but yeah i i think i think you're right that those were very cringy um the, the moment that made me sort of like lose it <laughs> was when they had all of this sort of fan uh, guest stars for the friends. Oh, who yeah, that was in, bad. Do little interludes about how you know I'm a celebrity and I I really liked Friends, and yeah. it's often that they had some kind of connection to HBO, such as like Kit Harrington. But the one that really made me lose it was when Malala Yousafzai. Oh, really? It was that one. Just appears, and it's like almost not commented on at all. How strange a choice. Uh, it is Malala loves friends, David. What I'm sure do? she does, as do many, many people. 
and she is absolutely a celebrity i'm not saying that it's not a great choice to get her but yeah it's just like what she stands for versus what like david beckham stands for right are so vastly different and the but fact that's, that that's it's the like the, the brand of friends and yeah. therefore the brand of hbo max that it can encompass these two vastly different uh you know People. modes of address yeah um that it can be friends inspires hope and change for the future and also isn't it funny when ross can't move a couch and he yeah. keeps saying p- to pivot <laughs> yeah it's interesting i mean it was one part that i found surprising and like I'm I'm sentimental, so it it made me tear up a little bit. But was like when all the people were like, I was going through a hard time in my life, and friends helped me. Right, <laughs> and, like, and they did, and that that one I think is super interesting because it was specifically through the lens of friends as international, uh, global uh, product mm-hmm. that you know that it's been translated into so many languages, and that you can find people who, you know, this helped save their life, not just in America, but in Ghana. I think they had several people that they interviewed in Ghana. And they had some Sengalese people. Um, right. They had um, French. There was uh, a, a German guy at the end. Right. Um, and the specific marketing that it, it this like helped teach BTS English. Oh my God. The BTS. That's the one I thought you were going to say I, instead of Malala. That uh, well, I, think, like, I think it's a great contrast. Don't you like we're the- BTS, we're HBO Max, we're BTS, we're Malala Yousafzai, we're David Beckham. These right. are the, this is the trifecta of completely different pop culture icons yeah. that, that we embody here. We and that are, we embody through buying friends. Right. We are pop culture now. Yeah. I think, actually, I think I'd like to make that sort of the, the thesis statement of this, if yeah. there is a thesis statement, is that what HBO Max has done here is they're buying friends in that they're buying allies. They're buying culture for sure. A hundred percent. Like you're not even wrong at all. Um, right. But the, by by buying friends, they get BTS is is great, and that they get the identity of we're a global company. We make content for people all, all over the world, even if that content is six white people of middle class <laughs> age living in New York in a unrealistic New York apartment. Yes, like even then. <laughs> we're a we're a global company appealing to all sorts of cultures right. so it's it's really a bizarre and phenomenal sort of uh, you know out of the two sides of the mouth kind of pitch to the the viewing public and i think the same goes for um fresh prince reunion to sort of switch gears a bit yeah uh in that the way that it, it the way that it touches on racial issues and how they were addressed in the show um Mm. did did you have any thoughts on 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 how they broached those topics what their reflections were and 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 how they pitched it yeah I mean you know they definitely leaned into you know this show was telling the truth about what it was like to be black um and you know uh I I did like the one um the one quote from uh, Tatiana is her name uh that's the, the actor's name yeah 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 the youngest sister um where you know she brought up the fact that like people would like talk about the show and like hashtag black excellence and stuff like that mm-hmm. um and that you know she's like it's not the wealth that's the excellence you know it's the way that they were able to conduct themselves and that it was the way they um you know, we're there for each other. And yeah, and uh, I, I think that that, you know, that follows in the scholarly literature, yeah. you know, on on the show, which mm-hmm. I, I haven't read too much of, but I have read about, you know, sort of the Cosby show, which has been written about a lot because it was yeah. this huge cultural tentpole. And it was the first depiction of the well-to-do, you know, black family. Uh, professional black family uh, in an upper middle class 
sort of setting. Mm -hmm. And usually what the, what the scholarly response to it is, is it's, it's sort of juggling these contradictions of, yes, it's a representation, it's an aspirational representation of a sort of colorblind world where you can exist without constantly dealing with the threats of, of racism. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it becomes a kind of talking point for right-wing idiots to say, well, why can't you all just be like, you know, the Cos the people on the Cosby show uh, right. and just pull yourselves up by your bootstraps and, you know, get things done. Mm -hmm. um, where I think the Fresh Prince doesn't really have to deal with necessarily that particular contradiction because of the character of Will. And right. just the, the fact that you're colliding two different sides of you know, two completely valid sides of Black yeah. culture. Right, right. And, and that's Black excellence. Both of these yeah. are, are Black excellence. Right. And I think, yeah. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, the fact that it was a show that definitely was not a, and this is a point that's made in the reunion special, um, that like it's a show that's not afraid to show that, you know, Black people are not a monolith. <laughs> like, right they act in many different ways in many different right. situations and, and, to, and to depict yeah. it as a conflict about the the movement you know right the 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 fight the mm -hmm. um what is the word they used the, the movement um, yeah uh the, that that it's it's depicted as like an an intellectual and and ideological sort of conflict between you know, class and race and privilege and all of these different mm -hmm. things that go into play in the um, <laughs> in the Fresh Prince show. Yeah. Uh, while we make fun of Carlton, <laughs> <laughs> but but I think also the the really interesting thing I think in the address of how these actors are talking about it, and this I think yeah. plays into kind of like how much of this is scripted because they're all sort of on the same page about this, mm -hmm. is that they all referred to the the Tuesday rehearsals as the place where representation matters, mm -hmm. you know, because it didn't matter to the positive portrayal of, of race in that show that there weren't many black writers on that show, or mm -hmm. they don't actually specifically reference any black writers. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I haven't looked at like all of the scripts, but I'd imagine that like the writing staff looked a lot like the writing staff for other NBC shows at the time. Right. Very white. <laughs> Very, very white uh, and very male. Um, but what they would say is, okay, but you have to take into account Tuesday when we're doing rehearsals, we're pointing out all of the inconsistencies. We're the voice of blackness in the show. Mm -hmm. And that was what I found interesting in that address. And I thought it kind of similar to the, we're HBO Max, we're a global company even though we're we're saying we're a global company by talking about six white people, right? We're the we're the company of of race relations, but we're only showing content from the '90s that was written all by white people. Right, right. <laughs> but but it can still be positive because you know Alfonso got to say no. Carlton would never say that, even though he's you know being written as a white black guy you know by white mm -hmm. writers yeah it's it's i mean it's definitely complicated um but like as far as cringe goes were there any like big moments from the fresh prince special that like really got to you well i did think like you said with with guest stars that mm -hmm. when little nikki you know the the kid from the later seasons w w came out and they didn't really know what to say to him. And they yeah. didn't really have anything for him to say. Because it's like, hey, I was eight. <laughs> You're so grown now. You're no longer eight. <laughs> yeah. Or younger. I, I don't even know how old he was. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's almost like no one wants to say like, you, you helped us jump the shark, you know, yeah. or, you know, nobody really latched onto you as a character, but we couldn't right. write you off because... It'd be cruel to write off an eight-year-old. <laughs> right. How do you write off an eight-year-old? Like, you can't. Um, um, also, the, the game show on the on Friends. That yeah. Was, that was clearly unscripted on one end, but Ross, or David Schwimmer, yeah. his, his part was completely scripted. So 
the mismatch there led to some some awkward exchanges yeah like the introduction for tom Selleck was very weird and yeah they're just like, like isn't it tom Selleck? and he's like <sighs> you'll see and then it was tom <laughs> Selleck. i don't understand. I think he was squinting because there was a second question under his question and he wasn't sure if he was supposed to read it oh so i i I can't know that for sure, obviously, but this is a pure speculation. But yeah, it's like it was done live, but without any rehearsal. It had to yeah. be done without rehearsal because it's they're playing it up like a game show, right? It doesn't doesn't quite work. Um, what about what about um, similarities in format between the the two shows? Uh, both of them start with characters one by one walking through the set. What did you think of the of those? Was there was there ideology at play? Yeah, I mean it's interesting because like I get it, you know, especially when you it's a sitcom, so your sets are basically the same always, you know. Um, like you're yeah, not doing a lot of perfectly recreated. Yeah. There's art in that that people scoured the old episodes to, you know, recreate props or or find them or find actually the same furniture Mm -hmm. um you know you'll see this there's you know um you know curb your enthusiasm did a kind of pseudo seinfeld reunion and they (laughs) did a behind the scenes of the making of that season Uh uh and what they talk about is like how do we find the old sets which some of them are now owned by jerry seinfeld right in his mansion (laughs) right how do you recreate that so there's art in that and then yeah. I think that there's um, a sort of like, like, hey, come here, I have a secret. Take a peek behind the curtain. Look, we're breaking open what you saw, which is just an individual set. It's all the sets right next to each other. Yeah. Cool. You idiot. Didn't you know that uh, Central Perk was right next to their apartment? You fool. You absolute buffoon. <laughs> um <laughs> Right. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I didn't hate it. Um, but at the same time, I felt like it wasn't for me. Like I get the impulse to show everyone's reaction to the set because I'm sure it was emotional for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's emotional for the actors. Yeah. That's what I mean. It was emotional for the actors. Um, but like, I like, was it supposed to be emotional like i guess it was supposed to be emotional for the audience as well for me right but it wasn't it was just like (laughs) yeah they did a good job (laughs) (laughs) right but i just think it's interesting like to see them you know what it is visual it's um, tagging along with a friend to like their childhood home or something where they're like wow oh my god it's just the same or oh it's so different and you're like okay <laughs> but i think the difference is like for people who have seen you know these shows it almost is I mean, like their home too you know for people who grew up watching these shows endlessly in mm-hmm. syndication you right. know it is home you know that is my home that mm-hmm. i'm that you're now walking through and it's even stranger because you've stripped out you know the fourth wall and you've you've added this single camera aesthetic to it Mm -hmm. I think like visually the image of like (laughs) David Schwimmer coming in from like an a white void is what you see on the other side of the stage doors which of course because it's daylight outside yeah uh and he walks in the stage doors zoom he's emerged from heaven and now he's walking across the moments of his life his past through the 90s and the early 2000s and and just viewing it and going like, wow, I lived a great life and now I'm dead. <laughs> like, that's the aesthetic that I got from it is that this is like, it's a wonderful life or, yes. you know, something like that. I don't know. I I, I don't know. I think it was interesting, at least in the Friends uh, reunion, you know, they talked about if they watched old episodes or not. Um, and basically everyone else did uh but then david schwimmer and and lisa kudrow were like i haven't really watched it in like 17 years and then i kind of revisited it for this it's like okay 
Well, I, I think that's supposed to be like, I think that's supposed to be acceptable. I don't think people are like judging her for that. In fact, I think they see it as kind of, you know, authentic or something mm-hmm. that like, oh yeah, I don't, I don't watch what I'm in. You know, it's not, it's, that's not why I do it. I do it because right. I care about the project, whatever. <laughs> um, well, I just, you know, I think that's interesting though, because I think that's definitely going to inform your reaction to walking in and seeing this set, you know, mm-hmm. like yeah. if you're, if you're watching the episodes, I think it's powerful in a way where it's like, oh, the thing that I love so much, like I'm here again, how exciting. And then, you know, for the people who haven't, it's like, I literally haven't like seen this <laughs> right. for like 17 so it's years. About the, the time gap, which yeah. is always a big part of these things. Um, yeah. The idea of we haven't all been in the same room together for 30 years or right. you know 10 15 years whatever right which is the um, whole point of a reunion yeah. but again it's like that's for you <laughs> like no one no, no no I don't I think that's totally backwards I think it Ugh. is for us I think that the the exclusiveness of it the peek mm. behind the curtain that couldn't happen without each of these people being paid five million dollars which they were um <laughs> <laughs> that they wouldn't naturally all be in the same room together, l- let alone on in the same room talking to us about their experiences and bloopers and behind the scenes, you right. know, and audition footage and all the other tropes of the reunion mm-hmm. special. Yeah. Um, I mean, I felt it's interesting because, you know, these are both films during the now times, the COVID times. Yes. Um, but the the Fresh Prince one, you know, it's no audience. It's, they're all in, a, it's just them in a room um, with occasional talking heads. And the Friends one, it's like, get people in here as much as possible. You know, like they're, yeah they're leaning into we can have an audience this is exciting um (laughs) but i think it and and also the fact that you know like james corden is there hosting whereas in the fresh prince one it's just kind of will smith which also was awkward in my opinion okay i i think i think that's uh, i think that's fair i think where the will smithiness of it comes in is that the real like origin of this Fresh Prince reunion, sure, they were always planning on doing it, but they they sort of tested the waters a little bit with Will's, you know, social media presence where he produces tons of content. He had a YouTube channel. He has a, a Snapchat story, whatever you call those things where, you know, yeah. it's a corporate produced whatever it called. And then for the, the pandemic, he had a Snapchat called, you know, uh, will from home and it's mm-hmm. W F H, you know, so it's like work from home, but it's will from, from home. home. And so he had a, a, a special where he did a cast reunion over zoom and also had like a projector behind him of the faces of the person he was talking to on his computer and a professional like camera work and whatever to, to do this Snapchat reunion. Uh-huh. And a lot, they cover a lot of the same ground, which, which I think adds to the sort of scriptiness of it, mm-hmm. but like him as host. Yeah, he is a host. He's the host of his own social media presence, which is and what his this own reunion life. is about. Yeah. His own life. Yeah. But the reunion is about Will blew up, you know, who didn't. Everyone, everyone. else. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is a fascinating difference between that and uh, Friends, where they're right. all a little washed up, you know. Yeah. Some more than others, yeah, for sure. But they've all had shows, you know. They've all had. I mean, not all of them have had films, right? But they've all they've all know, continued of... to have very notable careers, uh, ish. You right. know, even if they're still known as the person from friends right like that's their main thing they've all done at least one other major project right whereas you know for fresh prince there are other projects 
notable projects, major projects, projects I could name, not necessarily. Right, just projects that have, um, you know, uh, infiltrated the the cultural zeitgeist the way that these shows did in their prime. Right. I mean, I think the the cultural resurgence around Lisa Kudrow has been truly inspiring and <laughs> almost like, you know, it's like fishing, you know, gold out of a shit barrel. I, I don't know what the metaphor is, but like for for someone like me who does not like Friends, but likes Lisa Kudrow a lot. There you go. Uh, in her other roles. I think that there, there's been a cultural renaissance around her. I mean, Courtney, Co- there, I would agree that, that Lisa Kudrow has sort of had a renaissance uh, in yeah. the past 10 years or so. Um, but I think, you know, like, Courtney Cox was right. the draw Cougar for Cougar Town, you know, yeah. and like she... no, no, I mean she's she's a star. She is. Yeah. There's no and... denying that. And David Schwimmer has had projects that he's been the star that you right. can, you couldn't do without Schwimmer. I mean, Matt LeBlanc did uh, the prestige drama where he basically plays himself. Um, <laughs> oh, shit, what's it called? My mom was really into it back in like <laughs> right exactly 2010. your mom. Right. Really into it. And I, of course, Jennifer Aniston's film career you, exists. Yeah, it's it's better than everyone else on the cast's careers. But yeah, but it's not like it's unbelievable that she would hang out with these people still. No, no, absolutely <laughs> not. Um, um, and of course, there's always speculation in these ones, like who's aged better? Is anyone yeah. having problems? Who gained the most weight? I find those things very crass, but I, I yeah. understand the appeal of them. Yeah. Um, and of course, there was speculation about Matthew Perry because he was a lot quieter and his speech was kind of distorted. He said in interviews that he had last minute dental work, emergency mm. dental work. So, you know, but it fuels speculation. Whatever. I think, exactly. what about, um, do you have anything to say about sort of the think piece or f- uh, fan um, paparazzi uh content that came out after these specials you know the sort of write-ups um i honestly i i didn't see a ton i just saw like like the friends reunion here's what you missed because you didn't watch it exactly um and then right. i watched it so uh, i i don't know did you see anything that like really stood well, out to you well i just think any moment that they're purposefully trying to make a moment is going to get a dedicated think piece. And then of course, there's going to be a listicle of like, here's all the things you missed because you know, people do recaps of stuff all the time. But I just think like the idea of, oh, you know, bombshell, David Schwimmer and Jennifer Aniston had crushes on each other. And then mm-hmm. you do a whole write up on that. And then, oh my God, you won't believe what, um, what Janet said to uh, Will in this heart to heart right you were right up on that and i think that part of this is it's not a big write-up to say hbo just bought fresh prints (laughs) right (laughs) like you can't write something that gets clicks from that (laughs) but you can get clicks if you write uh, hbo got these two people in a room (laughs) and then they actually dished some dirt Right. And now everyone's going to go watch Fresh Prince to see, oh, could we maybe see the dirt in the performances in the in the second and third season? Mm-hmm. Uh, Who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah, no, for sure. It's it's manufacturing a narrative to some extent. Yeah. And it might be a narrative that is genuinely true in some respect, in some like part of it. Um but like the only reason you talk about a narrative in front of a camera is to like have that narrative be heard, you know? Um, and and people have a lot of different reasons for wanting things to be heard. Of course, yeah. I mean, you, yeah, you can't take out, you know, Janet's actual incentives in that moment to, mm-hmm. you know, disclose what she wanted to disclose. That yes, she gets to frame it as I'm telling my side of the story, even if she can't really say that Will, you know, what Will did in excruciating detail because it's Mm -hmm. a lighthearted thing. And if the takeaway is Will was really abusive on set, that's not a good takeaway. Yeah, it's a terrible takeaway. (laughs) 
Now, also, Will cannot say you were really actually creating trouble on set and I was justified to say that you were being difficult. Whether or not that's true, I'm not taking sides in this thing, but I'm just saying there's an, there's an element of what can't be said, what right. is not allowed to be said because it would right. destroy like, the fabric of the reunion. Exactly. Like this meeting, you know, you had to know that it was going to turn out well. And whether that means it was scripted to turn out well or like you have... Uh, you know, genuinely decided to uh, that like for press, forgive. you're gonna bury the hatchet. It's, exactly. You know, it's totally legitimate. Uh, you yeah. know, there's nothing illegitimate about right. sort of covering up a certain part of your feelings in order to create the most palatable image for your public. I guess that does sound kind of fake, but yeah, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's just it's something that you need to take into account while you're viewing it I think and I think mm -hmm. it's it's sitting in the back of your head even if you're sort of uncritically just sort of munching on that nostalgia right. root and I mean you know people are allowed to forgive <laughs> like no no of, of course like, I don't I would never want to suggest <laughs> that this was inauthentic because no one should ever forgive somebody right for right abuse. no no and though of course forgiveness is not required in all situations either right like, but in this situation it, it the was idea that you couldn't really say no to the apology right is is interesting and the fact that will waited until the very last second to say the words i'm sorry too yeah. and waited for her to apologize first yeah he's very conscious i think of how he is perceived in that moment He's so image conscious. Um, right, but of course he, I mean, he's a celebrity. Yeah. How could you not be image conscious <laughs> unless you're just completely oblivious? Right, right. Um, no, but I think there's a lot about Will Smith now that um, it feels very practiced. Like a lot of his mannerisms and the way that he talks and presents himself in public and when talking about his projects. Um, and, you know, I haven't watched his like Snapchat stuff so or his YouTube, so he could be like hella authentic and whatever there. But like even his authentic moments feel like there is always a sort of um, a certain amount of guardedness to them. Right. It's, it's what made me think of like BoJack Horseman, even though it's a very different kind of mm. reflection on sitcom abuse mm -hmm. and child stars and whatnot. None of the child stars in, you know, in the uh, Fresh Prince reunion said, being a child star messed me up psychologically, which is yeah. the case on many other sitcoms. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not going to say like, they were putting on a happy face necessarily uh you know i don't know what tatiana's internal life is but she seems yeah. incredibly well adjusted and happy and that she still has fond memories of the show yeah uh but of course there are other shows that will never get their reunion special because it would be too depressing right it would be because that's the thing about um you know, they talk about how like, oh, these are your families. Sometimes your family sucks, <laughs> you right. know? Exactly. There's no, that you have to sort of shave away the, the, the difficult aspects of these shows. Right. Like, you know, um, father, you don't, you don't talk about like your dad's flaws on father's day. You know, right. you don't use your mom's birthday as an excuse to go like, ah, uh, you know what sucked about you? <laughs> like, right. Yeah, and, and and yet in both specials, there's a moment in around the third act, if you're breaking it down by TV rules, mm -hmm. where, you know, at the start of the third act, we have to do the dark side no. or the things that went wrong or the mistakes or whatever. And so you have Ross talking about, I hated that fucking monkey, God damn it! I wanted to kill that fucking monkey. And then you have, uh you have you know um joey broke you know broke his broke arm. his arm he dislocated his shoulder in the middle yeah. of a shoot and they had to cancel the shoot and it's like so these are the problems that are okay to talk about yeah They're nobody's fault right no resolving them there's no latent lasting 
trauma or or disturbing impact of them it's just eh, right David and Sh- um, thought the monkey was tacky and, and ruined his takes <laughs> yeah which like legit fair enough Absolutely. um but uh you know in fresh fresh prince they have um uh oh god what's the name of will's friend who gets thrown out of the house jazzy jeff jazz yes uh you know he talked about how like yeah one day i had to do like 150 takes of me like getting thrown right. out of like various maybe places. exaggeration but yeah but like a lot you know yeah um and, and then they just ended up using the same, the shot, same shot for every time which of course then means he has an iconic shirt because right. he has to wear that shirt in almost every episode he appears in or if he's about to get thrown out of the house, he has to wear that shirt. That's he yeah. absolutely has to then. Yeah. Uh, but it, so it ultimately becomes sort of iconic just by accident. Right. <laughs> um. Yeah, I thought that was an interesting sort of disclosure of what what are we allowed to tell them about what yeah. works and what doesn't work. Yeah. Whereas most of the the special is just here are some of your favorite moments. Here are clips mm-hmm. of things that went incredibly well and they were magical and they, you know, was it the writer? Was it the actor? Was it the performance? Was it the director? It was everybody. It was a total collaborative effort and we get to reflect on how great it was. But, you know, I think it's interesting that each of them had this like low point, whether it was, you know, the Janet Will conversation and talking about um, the passing of uh, Uncle Phil's actor. Um, right or you know talking about having your dislocated shoulder in because right. that's the worst you can say about right. what happened on friends but it always <laughs> has to end with you know the ending of the show and like those big emotions around yeah, that the finale vibes yeah, yeah yeah um so like i think you know they take it to this like silly dark place so that they can transition into this pathos uh yeah the the pathos of it's ending and yeah you know and then it gets to drive home and this is the first time we're together since (laughs) that moment i love you guys Ah, you know (laughs) yeah yeah and everybody cries everybody cries oh yeah um i'm like i get it i was a theater kid (laughs) i get it but like i don't want to watch it Right. Well, we have to watch it because we have to talk about what is the role that these specials are playing in HBO's strategy in particular. Yeah. Um, I think I said it earlier, you know, it's we're HBO. We are culture. It's ours now. We have Sesame Street. We have like all the Ghibli movies. We have friends. You know, it's Pokemon. We have to catch them all. But them all is our nostalgia our our history our you know our our notions of of how we got to where we are right now there was you know the mention of legacy in fresh prince a lot where like we're one black sitcom in a long history of black sitcoms that led to the more progressive point that we're at right now um but i think i think basically there are two possible things that we can take away from the existence of these specials okay and i don't know this you know maybe there's a million other things that we can take from it but i think in terms of their strategy we can either read this as okay the the properties that hbo and other streaming sites are buying they're buying with longer term deals more almost permanent deals Mm -hmm. and that we're kind of having a settling of content Whereas in previous years, people would fight over content, keep it for a couple mm-hmm. months, maybe a year, and then lose it, and then try and reacquire something else so that there's always a new flow of content going into a particular streaming site. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think HBO is saying, no, we are settling. Where is the content landing? It's settling here. We now have a partial ownership. We have a stake in Friends this and Fresh brand. Friends because we've produced something for it. So it's sort of saying, look, you know, it's not becoming as worth it to shuffle things around. It's becoming more worth it to define your brand by the legacy content that you own. Mm -hmm. Um, The other possible takeaway though is almost the opposite, which is that things are still moving around at the same pace that they were. 
-hmm. but legacy content is now more valuable than it has ever been to the point where you can spend a couple billion dollars acquiring a Seinfeld or a Friends and not even bat an eye because Mm -hmm. we need we need new content always and none of the new content that we're producing is of any value so if you're going to spend 15 million dollars on a project you might as well spend it promoting the thing you already spent a billion dollars acquiring so those are i think the two potential takeaways maybe it's a combination of both now that i'm thinking about it um that things are settling down in terms of acquiring content but the value of that old legacy content has never been higher than it is right now yeah i mean i i would agree i think it's it's a combination i don't think the two are mutually exclusive at all right um you know i think and and again it's like everyone wants to define their brand but like you know what kind of brand is nostalgic 90s sitcoms oh it's the brand where it's like we have your past (laughs) you know we, like we have your childhood we, owe we literally have your it. family right <laughs> like we have your family and we have your friends <laughs> like, if you'd like to see them again you'll pay us 15 dollars a, a month for the right. rest of your life <laughs> exactly <laughs> um they're holding yeah. them hostage yeah yeah absolutely and um you know and i think being like you know we I I think it's not a secret that the industry, you know, is favoring tested IP right now. You know, they're not funding a lot of brand new, never before seen ideas. It's all. Yeah, of course we can say there's a ton of reboots and and remakes. And and we say that almost every week, it seems like (laughs) now. Uh, Right. And sequels and reimaginings and revivals. There's a new Mm -hmm. iCarly. It's. I mean, Cruella, like we talked right. about that so recently, you I mean, know? I mean, it seems like we talk about it every week because it so defines the media that we're consuming on a daily basis. Right. The recombination of, of existing IP. But the reason for that is pretty clear. It's it's that these, whenever you try and do something new, it doesn't guarantee, uh, it doesn't guarantee a return. A exactly exactly kind of return and right these guarantee your return people tuned for sure. in for the friends reunion they had been asking it for it since the end of the series there was famously an episode of uh 30 rock where jennifer aniston guest starred and the title of the episode was the one with the cast of night court and the joke was that the, it, they allude to creating a reunion of a beloved sitcom and right. it's night court instead of friends. Yeah. So I, I, people have been talking about this since, you know, 2007, 2008. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, forever. People have been talking about this. Um, it, yeah. I, and, and like, you're <laughs> as judgy as we are being, you're not a bad person if you enjoyed these. <laughs> like, no. And if you no, found no. them like really moving and they like, like I cried a little bit during both of these, you know? Oh, I mean, when um, they were talking about the the acting performance of, yeah. of Will working with uh, his mentor and right. also his father figure and also his, you know, character's father figure about talking about fatherhood yeah and the fact that his dad you know didn't want him or he Mm -hmm. felt like his dad didn't didn't want him and then finding love and acceptance in this found family it's one of the most moving scenes of the show Mm -hmm. and then to recap it through the lens of these are the emotions i was going through at that time as an actor this is the growth i was experiencing as an actor Mm -hmm. this is what i've lost since I can no longer return to the past where he's still alive and where I can be that actor just sort of starting out again. That kind of loss is not replicable outside of the format of the reunion special. Right, right. Um, And I mean, like, that's, like, there's moving stuff. And, like, there... I did enjoy seeing the friends being friendly friends. with one another. Uh, yeah, you yeah. like you like to imagine that, yeah, they really are like that. They really do like each other. And mm-hmm. they keep alluding to this thing of chemistry mm-hmm. as if that requires everybody to like each other. I respectfully disagree with that reading. Okay. But, I mean, I'm coming from a place of, you know, 
some of my favorite sitcoms where I think they have the greatest chemistry as actors are Arrested Development, which involved abuse. There was right. clear abuse of Je- from Jeffrey Tambor of, yeah. um, of Jessica Walter and mm-hmm. other people in the cast. Right. And uh, another one of my favorite casts is Community, where mm-hmm. famously Chevy Chase didn't want to be there. Yeah. Uh, tons of actors left over, you know, seeking out other projects, very not uh, friends, you know, like right. everyone in Friends could have left to seek other projects by season seven, let's say. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but they didn't. Yeah. And, you know, that's why we can say, oh, they all loved each other. They all had chemistry. They all wanted to be there. But I don't think that that necessarily makes it a better show. <laughs> right, right. That's all I'm saying. You're right, but it makes it um, it makes it feel special, whether or not yes. it actually is or not. It is yes. the the pathos, uh, as we mentioned earlier. It's that um, yearning <laughs> for something that seems simple and it feels good. And I think that's really valid to want that in your life and to get that from this. I think, I think if that's what floats your boat, let it sail. Let it sail. I think that's uh, (laughs) as good a place as any to leave it. Uh, Yeah. I I feel like we've, we've reached some sort of conclusion or catharsis in this. And I I think (laughs) both of these specials were about catharsis. Uh, yeah. But I'm sure we've left out uh, a lot of interesting observations. So uh, please tweet at us your favorite moments from these reunions or tweet at us your favorite reunion special of the past. Yeah. Because, like I said, this is nothing new. This existed mm-hmm. on television since the beginning, since I and Love it, Lucy, since the will Dick Van Dyke show. continue to exist forever. <laughs> I like, assume, yeah. As long as there is TV, this will exist. Right. And I mean, maybe the big budget uh, sitcom reunion may disappear or may reconfigure, alchemize into something else. This is what we're dealing with now in terms of our nostalgia, yeah. in terms of what's marketable. So, yeah. yeah. Um, so let us know your your, your observations. <laughs> and uh, next week, we got another standing Stanley Tucci coming at you. All right, we'll see you guys then. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.